It's Toyota time, folks, and of course, being the highlight of 1.44 for many of us, naturally, you would want to talk about it. Many of us have been talking about it, and it's fantastic to not only have such a legendary car back, of course, there are still other legends from this kind of prototype era, which we'd love to see, both slightly newer and slightly older, stuff like the Peugeot 905, Bentley Speed 8, but having this one back is arguably even more important than those because if nothing else its longevity in the series is so iconic you could easily put the gt1 up there with stuff like the Pennzoil skyline the escudo the castrol supra the r390 and a handful of others which really are that level of iconic within gran turismo with the toyota it's one of those cars that is not only iconic but it consistently lives up to being just so, so good to use. In every single Gran Turismo game that this car arrives in, it's always a top tier choice. But that's where things get interesting now, because for the first time ever in the Gran Turismo series, it is not a top tier car. It's of course in Group 2. And that changes everything in terms of using this thing, because back in the day you would have stuff like the Panos, uh, the Lister Storm potentially, the Mercedes CLK LM, or as it was misnamed back then, the CLK GTR mostly, all in the same kind of tier of racing as stuff like the Pescarolos, the Minolta, and pretty much everything in that iconic category. And some were definitely a lot quicker than others, but it was not uncommon to see stuff like the Gillette Vertigo <laughs> racing up against a vehicle like this and having a decent enough chance. That is not the case anymore because now, with this one being split into an entirely different category, it's a Golf that was never there before. The idea of this being in a lower class to something like an R92CP or a 787B flies in the face of how iconic the GT1 is in Gran Turismo, but of course it does make sense. Regulations change, and if the game is going to try and be more realistic in terms of how quick these vehicles should be, in relation to each other, then fair enough, it should be in Group 2. Now in terms of spec, we already touched on the fact in my review of the update as a whole that the specs are a bit weird. The weight is exactly what you'd expect, 900 kilos, of course it's mid-engine, rear-wheel drive, turbo aspirated. The price, incidentally, is a lot cheaper than I thought it could be. I was expecting maybe 4 million or so, which of course it used to cost that kind of price back in at least Gran Turismo 4. I don't recall what the price was now in Gran Turismo 6, but I think it might have been something like like 2 million, so I guess it's not too much of a change from the Gran Turismo 6 days, but it's 2.5 million at the moment in the Haggerty collection, and of course that could change. Well, based on other ones in the past, like the 911 GT1, it certainly could change, but we'll have to see, I guess. For now, though, it is the best time to get it, I would say, because I don't see the price going down. Maybe it could, but seems unlikely. And in terms of the power, that is in particular what surprised many of us, certainly myself. When I went into the Haggerty dealership and saw 764 horsepower, that was so weird. Like, that does not make sense given that the car should have more like 600. So it does appear, again I alluded to this before, it kind of feels and looks like it's in more of a qualifying trim. We've talked again before on how unfair that is to have certain cars in more of a qualifying trim, or at the very least close to a qualifying trim, and then others which are not allowed to be anywhere near their qualifying level. Again, perfect example, the R92CP. If you want to have qualifying trims, it should have 1,200 horses, which it certainly doesn't, even fully upgraded. But that's by the by. I think the fact that this one does have more horsepower is probably due to two things in particular. Number one, of course, it's a fan favorite, so they're going to give it a little bit more leeway. Secondarily, though, I do think that the fact that it's a Toyota and they have such a strong relationship with Toyota Toyota in this game in particular, Toyota and Porsche really being the two standouts of GT7, it doesn't surprise me at all that they would give this car a little bit of a bump. Of course in the time trial they do nerf it a little bit. The unfortunate thing is they make it heavier too for no apparent reason, up to like 950 kilos, but even just the power drop. It's a bit more realistic I guess, but not too many of us are going to complain if it means that the GT1 can be tremendously quick. And quick it is, because the standard point level is 844, a hair under 845, and interestingly, even when you give it the best possible turbo, which bumps the power up to around 860, I think it is, if I recall correctly, the point level doesn't actually change all that much. It's still well under 900. Of course, here I'm using it in the new 900 point event. It clears the, the grid so easily, at least in terms of first impressions, and I've driven this in a few different forms now, from the time trial. Uh, I've even done a, uh, well, I guess this is kind of a teaser for the future, a detuned blank red version perhaps with a license plate. I'll let you decide what that could be for in future. 
but in every form it's a beast and of course you kind of have to make it a beast because it's such an iconic car it does at the same time though feel justified in being because it is such a tremendously quick machine and it did almost win Le Mans outright, let's not forget that. So pace was certainly not something that the Toyota had trouble with. Personally, I've always found this to be, if not the most beautiful, certainly one of the most beautiful Japanese prototype cars ever. I think the Minolta is a stunning shape as well, but something about the Toyota with the liveries it had is just such a good looking car, even better looking, I would argue, as the road version. In terms of its ultimate ability, most of that remains to be seen depending on balance of performance because the McLaren is very strong the Mercedes is you could probably argue the best of this kind of 90s Le Mans scene within group two some might argue the McLaren personally from my experience I definitely found the Mercedes to be far more OP this one I think I would probably say it's even better than the Merc I haven't raced them one to one to compare balance of performance lap times but it definitely feels quicker if nothing else. The Mercedes, as I've said numerous times throughout the series, to me the Merc always felt like more of a touring car that was kind of stretched in terms of its handling, which is great, but it had that bit more heaviness to it, whereas the GT1 definitely feels like that, a GT1. It feels super lightweight, super sharp, just flies through corners, and it really does feel kind of like that pinnacle of the point right between Group C and LMP1, with kind of similarities to both, but not quite either. It's almost like the, the, the sweet spot, if you will, up there with, I guess, the 911 GT1 race car, which again is quite an obvious omission to have, especially with the road car. That would be a very cool Group 2 machine to have in future, a 911 GT1, especially the GT198 version, with that exposed back end that you can see through to the engine, the one which Forza commonly features. Very, very cool car as well. Ultimately, this one I think is a fantastic return. This is definitely one of the standouts in recent memory for me in terms of a car being brought back. There are still plenty of issues with this game, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't mean that we can't enjoy some good moments. And to me, this is definitely one of those good moments. Not everything is bad. A lot of things are, but not everything. And this is one of the bright spots, I would say. It's a shame that we don't have a new circuit to enjoy it on, but again, that's by the by. To me, the fact that we have it with that cockpit in full HD with some interesting visual mods as well, or at least one visual mod where you can kind of de-restrict, if you will, the air intakes on the front end to have the different shape depending on the year and the livery. That's a cool little touch. But yeah, it's, it's an icon. They had to have it back at some point. And here's hoping that we might get a few more either in the next game or this game, such as the 905, the R390, and maybe some others too. But that's it for my thoughts on the GT1. Of course, I would love to hear yours. I'd especially love to hear if anyone perhaps doesn't like it. I'd be curious to know what somebody may have found disappointing about the car or if it didn't live up to what they were hoping. I certainly haven't seen any of that, but I would be interested to know if anyone found any downsides to it. Because in terms of being popular and certainly being well received by the fandom, this might actually be one of the absolute favourites I've seen in terms of updates. Like I said though, that's it for my thoughts. I'll see you tomorrow with of course the Lamborghini Urus review, and until then I'll see you next time. But for now, thanks for watching.